Hi, and welcome to video number six of Unit 5, Sectional Divide and Reconstruction from 1844 to 1877. Today, we're going to be looking at topic 5.7, the election of 1860 and secession. So let's start with how the division in the Democratic Party helped to secure Lincoln's election in 1860. So a little bit of background to the 1860 election was in 1858, Abraham Lincoln was running not for president, but for senator uh, in the Illinois senator's seat race. He was running against Stephen Douglas. Now, you may remember him from the last video when we talked about the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Now, the Lincoln-Douglas debates were a series of debates held in 1858. Sometimes people think that they were held right before the 1860 election, but that's not true. It was actually before the Senate election in 1858. Um, now, these debates were pretty hotly contested. People largely thought that Douglas was going to come out on the better end of these because he was a very famous orator. But Lincoln really held his own and argued with logic rather than emotion. But all in all, uh, Lincoln ended up not winning the Senate seat. Douglas won the seat, but he definitely won by a closer margin than you would be expecting. And he won with districts that contained smaller populations than those that actually voted for Lincoln. So the 1858 senatorship is really a Senate election was really what put Lincoln sort of on the sort of national map for politics and made people begin to think that perhaps he might be a plausible candidate for the presidency. Now, Abraham Lincoln was part of the new Republican Party that had just formed a few years earlier. And honestly, the Lincoln-Douglas debates in this Senate election really caused some problems for Stephen Douglas. So Stephen Douglas really alienated his own parts of his own party. Now, at this time, the Democrats have both Northern Democrats and Southern Democrats. It's not purely a regional party yet, but it is starting to see fracturing along regional lines. Now, Douglas is going to alienate the Southern Democrats in two ways. First of all, in 1857, he rejected the Lecompton Constitution for Kansas. You might recall hearing about that as a pro-slavery constitution that was created for Kansas. He saw it not as, as not valid, <clears throat> and he rejected it. And then the second thing is, during the debates themselves, the debates themselves, he issued what can only be called the Freeport Doctrine. This was his response to Lincoln's Freeport question, which was a question that Lincoln asked him in Freeport, Freeport, Illinois. Um, Lincoln asked him this. In the Dred Scott decision, the Supreme Court established that slavery could not be prevented in any state. You may recall in the last video, we talked about the fact that the Supreme Court, which was led by mostly Southern Democrats, decided that men could not be deprived of their private property, even in free states, which meant that slavery could essentially be allowed in free states. So in the Dred Scott decision, the Supreme Court established this idea that slavery really couldn't be prevented in any state. But Lincoln said, what if a state or territory actually votes down slavery? Who then would decide the future of slavery in that state, the people or the Supreme Court decision? Now, Douglas was a huge supporter of popular sovereignty, and he declared that the people's will must be followed in this case, even if it contradicted the Dred Scott decision made by the Supreme Court. And this really alienated the pro-slavery Southern Democrats. At that point, they decided there is no way we want Stephen Douglas to become our candidate for the presidency in 1860. OK, so this is really where we see our divide coming from. The Democrats were just absolutely hopelessly split at this point into Northern and Southern Democrats. The Southern Democrats were very unwilling to accept Douglas as their candidate. Now, they did try to have a Democratic nominating convention in Charleston. And when the Northerners made it very clear that Douglas was their choice as a candidate, the, the Southern Democrats literally just walked out of the convention. And they tried again in, uh, in, uh, in the, uh, Baltimore. And they had another convention. And once again, uh, it ended with the Southern Democrats walking out, at which point they essentially, the Northern Democrats said, well, we're going to have Stephen Douglas as our candidate. The Southern Democrats created their own convention and they elected John Breckinridge as their candidate. So now there's two candidates for the Democrats and a few other Democrats trying to walk this moderate line between these two groups, form a separate party entirely and elect a third candidate whose name was John Bell. So essentially now the Democratic Party has split basically into three groups with three different candidates. And if you know anything about elections, this is not really a great thing if uh, all the opposition or 
you know, great for Lincoln, but not a great thing for the political party, for the Democratic Party themselves, because they had split into so many smaller groups. They don't have enough popular support for any of those groups to really gain the presidency. Now, the Republicans are going to nominate Abraham Lincoln, and the Republican platform was widely appealing to many different groups in the United States, except, of course, the Southerners. But remember, the Southerners have less people than the North does. So the platform was very, very appealing to all these different factions. Now, they had all these different uh, aspects that appealed to different groups of people. The Republican Party platform declared non-extension of slavery, uh, not creating more slave states that was appealing to the free soilers they declared they wanted a protective tariff a heavy protective tariff that was appealing to northern manufacturers they said that we'll build a pacific railroad that was appealing to those living in the northwest they declared that we will create funds for federal internal improvements that was appealing to the westerners and also that free homesteads would be carved out of federal lands and that was really appealing to farmers so very very broadly appealing now Notably absent, and this is important to understand, was any appeal to the abolitionists. Abolitionism was still seen as a pretty radical stance, and whatever Abraham Lincoln's private beliefs may have been, even though he publicly went on record multiple times saying that he did not believe in, in, in equality, perfect equality between different groups of people, between blacks and whites, he definitely um would not uh definitely in the republican party stance they're not favoring outright of abolition neither the republican party nor lincoln favored that now despite the fact that they did not favor abolition the south essentially warned that listen if lincoln becomes elected this is going to split the union because lincoln's stance of not extending slavery meant that well the only other option is if the country continues to expand is that free states would expand and as we've discussed in class and in other videos that would upset the delicate balance in the senate which was pretty much exactly evenly divided between northern states and southern states. So as long as there's that perfectly even divide, if southern states always voted as a block, there was no way for any, you know, curtailment of slavery, any legislation of pass that would stop or end slavery. But if more and more free states were added, then that balance would be overthrown. And you may remember the House of Representatives was already heavily favoring northerners, mostly free soilers and free states because there were simply more people there. So the House of Representatives already leaned towards the North. The, the delicate balance in the Senate was the only thing that presented, prevented in their minds the complete overthrow of slavery. So the South essentially said, look, if Lincoln's elect elected, we're done. We are going to split the union. We will secede. Mostly South Carolina said this. You remember South Carolina has a history of threatening secession. You might recall the uh, 1832 nullification crisis. Okay, so let's talk about the election of 1860. Now, as you might imagine, because of all this splitting, yes, Lincoln is going to win. Spoiler. Uh, Lincoln didn't actually win the majority of the popular vote. He only won 40% of the popular vote, although that was more than any other candidate. So he won 40% uh, of the popular vote, but he, he won, as you know, our presidents are elected by elected electoral vote, he won 60%, nearly 60% of the electoral votes. Now, he did not get a single electoral vote from the Southern states. In fact, many Southern states didn't even put him on the ballot. Uh, but because of this divide between his opponents, you can see these election maps here. Because of this divide, you can see that uh, there were there was this division in the Democratic Party. So you can see all these um, really kind of deep Southern states are going to go for Breckenridge, that Southern Democrat. Uh, the uh, Douglas is going to carry Missouri. And then John Bell, that kind of middle of the road candidate, is going to carry these Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia. Okay, so um, I think it's worthwhile noting, though, if you look at the electoral vote, even were you to add up all of the electoral votes, even if the Democratic Party had not been split between three different groups, Lincoln still would have won the election. It still would not have been enough electoral votes to defeat Lincoln, although it's worthwhile noting that perhaps if the Democratic Party had been more unified, they might have been able to appeal to some of these southern or western states. And also know these big territories right here, these are not states yet, so they did not get to vote in the election. So Lincoln was pretty clear once he was elected that he wasn't going to mess with slavery in the South. He wasn't going to try to get rid of slavery in the South. But he did essentially promise that expansion of slavery was done. And as I've already just described, this would guarantee the growing political dominance of the North in, in the Senate. And the Southerners saw this as just a slippery slope that would eventually end in the end of slavery. And 
that's entirely plausible. And on top of that, the South was still really freaked out by the Harper's Ferry debacle with John Brown uh, a few years prior. They felt that the North essentially wanted to destroy the South. So it became, you know, this kind of sense in their minds that North was was just gunning for the South. Okay, so the decision to secede was definitely led by South Carolina. Um, the uh, Despite the fact that Democrats <clears throat> the Democrats actually still had considerable political power. I mean, they had a majority on the Supreme Court. They had significant representation in both houses of Congress. The Republicans did not hold a majority of either the House of Representatives or Congress. There were still other political parties that prevented them from holding a majority in either of those. Uh, so the Democrats still had a lot of power. But despite this, probably because South Carolina has essentially made this promise in 1860, December of 1860, and this is, by the way, three months before Lincoln was actually inaugurated, but just a few days after he was elected, South Carolina is going to secede. So within six weeks, South Carolina will be joined by six other states, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, Mississippi, Louisiana, and then later on in spring of that uh, 1861, Virginia, Arkansas, Tennessee, and North Carolina will also secede. Now, if you look at this map here, you'll notice it was by no means completely unanimous. Uh, there were many that were for secession, but notice all these green areas. You can see really if you see the reflection of like these Appalachian, uh, Appalachian Mountain areas where you had a lot of uh, mountain citizens that were anti-planter, anti-slavery. You can definitely see their impact there in sort of these regions and a couple of regions are closer to the north. Uh, and also in Texas, even in Texas, it was fairly divided um, in some areas over, over whether or not to secede. And in fact, the governor of Texas was essentially ousted from office by secessionists because uh, Sam Houston was a unionist. So he was ousted by secessionists. So um, this was not a unanimous decision, but enough support happened that 11 states seceded. Now, they made up the Confederate States of America. They chose Jefferson Davis as their, as their president. Jefferson Davis had been a senator from Mississippi, and they created a new constitution. That constitution severely limited federal power, and it contains provisions that enshrined slavery in perpetuity, never to be abolished. So in like the last several decades there's something you know there's been some debate in the historical community over oh well did the south really secede because they wanted to hold slaves or is it because just about states rights and yeah i mean a little bit states rights but mostly there's the right they were most concerned about was holding slaves and this is really clearly reflected in the creation of the constitution that enshrines it forever that was their big concern was the loss of slavery the loss of their uh, economic way of life which they kind of equated to the southern way of life so um this decision ultimately is going to really rock the union and there was not a hundred percent agreement on what to do about this decision like there were parts of the north that just said okay just let them go just just let them go let them form their own country but most people realize that especially in the government realize that this would be a nightmare because it would show the weakness of the united states to the rest of the world if the united states did not hold together and broke into multiple countries then it would essentially just make them weaker in the eyes of the rest of the world and European countries. And, you know, at what point do European countries decide that the United States is in enough disarray that they could probably act aggressively against them? So foreign affairs was a real concern as well. OK, so we're going to get a little bit more into the Civil War in the next couple of topics, in the next couple of videos. So I'll see you guys then.